Welcome back to another edition of Summer is Coming. I'm your host, Tiny Grimes, and as always, I'm joined by Neil the... What the? This is two weeks in a deal. row. Oh, you, you are the real deal. Okay, Jason, <laughs> the new real deal. Welcome, Jason. Thank you, Tiny. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. Um, <laughs> this episode, we're going to talk about uh, a, a regional that just happened. We're going to talk about Jason's deck specifically because I think it's really neat. It's one of the things I want to do more often on this podcast is to talk about a specific deck that I think is very interesting. And we're going to talk about the meta a bit. So, Jason, let's start with the tournament. Uh, this is, what, your, like, 20th regional of the season? How many regionals have you been to? I just went to the three that were in the southwest. I went to Phoenix, and then I went to Northern California and Sacramento, and then just here in the Los Angeles area. Okay, gotcha. This was my only regional um, I don't know if you heard the story, Jason. I did not think I was going to this regional. And then at about 2 a.m. the night before, I realized, huh, I might actually be able to pull this off. So I threw together a deck that was completely untested. And so if you're going to do that, Jason, what house are you going to use? You're going to use Lannister. Of course you're going to use Lannister. <laughs> and so so my thought was I, I played uh, Targ Lannister at Kublai Khan and did well with that. And I was thinking I could do that again. But I'm wondering if SoCal is finally going to catch up to the fact that Stark is good. We haven't yet. And if they do, Winterfell is a pain in the rear for that deck. So I decided, here's what I'm going to do. Lannister Crossing means I still get all the awesome kill events and such. And if they go Stark Winterfell, I might just be able to rush them down with Crossing before they can get all their shenanigans set up. So, so that's the way I went. Um, it went pretty well for me. What, what kind of deck did you play? Very briefly, because we're going to go over it more uh, in a bit. Yeah, I played a Baratheon Banner of the Rose deck that I've been playing in all three regionals, and uh, it was a good it was a good time. I mean, the event itself was was a lot of fun. I mean, just like when you talked about Kubla, tons of you know amazing players and great faces. I think we ended up having fifty something. Do you have a better number? Fifty two. I think fifty two was the number. Fifty two, yeah. just pretty solid. Uh, it was a crammed house. It was a good time, and um, yeah, just showing uh, having a good time in SoCal. And, and you know, the thing about it too that I like to note is that. And I love it when players travel from out of town. Um, you know, there's a couple people who traveled, uh, you know, probably about five hours or less, coming from Vegas, Sacramento. Other than that, we kept it really to the area, to the region, and that just shows that even though this game is really young, it's, you know, I know the game in 1.0 obviously had a lot of strength in this area, but still, there's still, you know, newer players coming, and I think we're going to see a really good growth in the next year. And if that was a Netrunner regional, the first year of Netrunner as a ex, you know, or I guess I still play Netrunner, but as a Netrunner, you know, player, that would have been a really great showing. So, pretty yeah. happy. I think our population has about doubled in the area, which is really interesting. Um, yeah. I know for Los Angeles, it has expanded exponentially, because up in LA, we had really shrunk down with Bruno not playing quite as much, a lot of the other guys not playing. We have this whole new crop of players that it's been really fun to to get to know them and meet them um so i'm going to talk real quick about my my event i'm not going to say much um i'd say out of my six swiss games four were just ridiculously boring and they were typical 2.0 games uh either i got big guys out and killed my opponent's big guys or they got big guys out and killed me only one only happened to me once i went five and one so i was happy with that part i had another game against a martel player that was more interesting and then in my sixth round, we were both 4-1. Uh, I played against Kelsey, is her name, and she played a uh, Bear Fealty deck. And that was actually a great game. Like, I forgot how much fun I have playing Game of Thrones until I played that game. I was like, oh my goodness! We're, like, making plays and counter plays and pro plays. We're not just like, okay, watch this. Watch this. You're never going to believe this. Gregor attacks. <laughs> Check this! Put to the sword! You didn't see that coming, did you? There was none of that. It was all kinds of great plays. I went like eight plots, almost went to time. I was able to win 15-14 with some really clutch treacheries on her painted table, milking Stannis over and over, not hitting Mel to try to save it for the Stannis so I could stand my thousands of dudes. Really fun game and uh, made me remember why I love it so much. Then, Jason, did you hear about what happened after Swiss? You know, I, I may have, but I'd love to hear it again. So... <laughs> After Swiss, something bad happened. The guy running the store did a great thing. He said, we're going to deck check all the decks to make sure there's no illegal decks. Um, which is good and bad. I mean, there's a downside to that. Like, if you're running a Targ deck with five Dracarys, you just make a 62-card deck, you write down the 60, and then you pull the two Dracarys where you hand it in for a deck check. 
but that's that's another sure. story. Um, but but the point is for me, I made a bunch of changes at the shop, right? Remember I said I built my deck at 2 a.m. I was driving up and I was like, oh my goodness, this deck could use two Serios. That would be amazing. You know what else? Brothel Madam can suck it. She's terrible in this meta. I'm not even playing her. So I get to the store. I make a couple changes. It's all really fast. My sheet is like crossing out and number changes. And we go to the deck check. And right before the deck check, I just counted my deck. And I was like, uh, I have 63 cards? I don't play with 63 card decks. I don't believe it in princ on principle. There's no way I handed in a 63 card deck list. Uh, this is going to be bad. Time sure enough. Sweat. What's up? You were sweating. Yes. Oh, I was sweating. <laughs> sure enough, he calls me over here, Tiny. Um, so I see Brothel Madam in your deck, and I see her crossed out. And I was like, yeah, because she sucks. Uh, okay, that's what happened. <laughs> so I explained to him what happened. And, and so so in 1.0, what you would do is you would just flip it around and, and, and turn the card around and be a blank card. And as long as your deck is still legal, right, as long as you meet banner requirements and such, you're fine. Um, and so we went through all the documents, the tournament documents, and there's actually nothing in there about my situation. And so he's like, uh, I'm not even really sure what I'm supposed to do. And so everyone at the event is just going, here's what you do. You just leave the brothel madam in there. It's a 63 card deck. Now it dilutes the deck. It's totally fine. Just leave it. It's not a problem. The deck is perfectly legal. Just let it be. Um, and he went with flip the card around to make it blank, which is totally fine by me. But I was, t I was sitting there terrified going, if I get DQ'd on this stupid thing, especially after going on to a podcast last week and talking about how <laughs> dumb people are that don't have an aggro deck list, my face is going to be very red. So. You still should have a red face. That's oh. despicable. Oh, I did. I did. Uh... Yeah. I just loved it because you were sweating. It, it was, was embarrassing. It was really embarrassing to have. I mean, first of all, let's just let's just take a moment real quick to just <sighs> let him be embarrassed, everyone. Yeah. Everyone who's watching, yeah, he's it's bad. It's bad because <laughs> you don't run a Lannister deck with sixty-three cards. Like, you're, the, the less chances you're getting tied with a Tyrion. Don't be an idiot. Uh, so yeah, yeah, dumb all around. Made the cut. Uh, didn't do that well in the cut. I actually got two point would in. You know, that first round where my opponent went turn one, uh, he had a great flop, I had a terrible flop, it allowed him to easily navel with the Kraken boat on the board with, like, three characters and a King's Road, and then he sure. pops the King's Road for Asha, dupes her. Turn two is Balon, Chair, and the Raiding Longship, and I'm like, well, this is really bad, but I do have a treachery. Like, I next turn I can play some characters, I treachery the Chair... I might be able to just kind of hang on. I have the giant hand. He pulls out the treachery. And I'm like, ah, well, that's, that's going to be a problem. We'll see what happens next turn. And then he's like, Miri. I'm like, so, so let me get this straight. Did we have a deal where you got to just put your top 10 cards on your deck and then just draw them up? Or no, we didn't. Okay, cool. Um, so, yeah, that was kind of annoying. Put in the smash. What's that? So got smash. Yeah. That, it happens, right? Like, to me, 2.0 is about making the cut and then you do not know what's going to happen in the cut like two getting 2.0 it happens and if it happens in the cut it happens in the cut and you just hope to god that it doesn't yeah i'm gonna take a second to talk about it because it's really interesting because a lot of games you know this live and die by the single game thing is is frustrating it's it's a lot of work i used to play poker professionally for a little bit and uh and so when you play a tournament you know you can't look at any given tournament in poker as a result you know, you play thousands of hands and it doesn't really matter because, you know, the single tournament isn't relevant because sometimes you're going to get effectively 2.0. Uh, whereas, so you, when you look as, as a tournament pro in poker, you have to look at a series of tournaments and see how you did because you're going to get some really bad beats and you're going to get some really fortunate wins as well. So you kind of take that and, you know, you've got to play a run of tournaments to even say, did I do well? And then you look at those tournaments, you say, well, let's let's look at the amount of information of these events. Let's, let's, you know, let's get an average, let's get a mean figure out what we did here and so then you can be proud of yourself but going to one tournament's tough because like you said you get in that top eight you know with swiss you have a chance to lose one maybe two at best depending on the size of the event yeah. and uh but most likely only one loss and then you get in there stuck what i really like about uh you know a lot of games is either a match series like magic where you get best out of three or even a netrunner where it's not best out of three but because you play two smaller games you just play one game and then you get put to a double elimination bracket and right. Even though it would extend the time of events, I really think that 
you would see a lot of really great Game of Thrones games if you went to a double elimination bracket uh, in total and maybe even push it to another day for the top eight or something like that. It would be difficult. I know it's frustrating, but if you want a regional to be more legitimate, I think that's what you need to do. Without it, you're going to see a lot of one-offs. Not saying the people who win do, are not deserving. They certainly are. But sometimes you see some really bad results, and it's not necessarily your fault. You know, you can go undefeated in seven rounds in Swiss, and then lose yeah. your first top eight game, and then you're just you're you know you're pretty screwed. And it's like that's yeah. really unfortunate that you've had that the opportunity to get that loss. So. I like uh, I like seeing the double elimination, and I'd be interested to see if a bigger tournament can adopt something like that. Yeah, I think regionals is probably not big enough. I think it needs to I be not. something where, like a Worlds or, or a Nationals, where you're flying there, you're dedicating your weekend. It already is the cut the next day, right? Like, if you're already doing the cut the next day, then you have all this extra time to be able to do sure. something like that. So, yeah, I, I think that could be really interesting. Back in 1.0, I know I know people hate when when you talk about this, but in 1.0, it seemed like, at least it seemed like, that there was less of a situation where you didn't know who was going to win. Like, if Bruno sat down and he was in the top eight, you knew he was going to win the tournament. Like, if his deck made it to the top eight, it was very rare when he actually lost. You're like, oh, sure. whoa, Bruno lost? What happened? You know, and it'd be some somebody maybe outplayed him, and, and it's, it was somewhat rare. But now it seems like it happens more often where... Something crazy can happen. I'll be interested to see how it evolves and what those changes are. I personally still just believe with a 60-card deck, you're drawing about 10 to 11 cards off the top before the game begins, so you're looking at a 50-card draw. Yeah. Still, you only draw two cards a turn plus whatever card draw you can muster. It's You rarely get through half your deck, so it's very easy for ha- your cards to not come at this point. So either you know flushing it out a little bit better uh, – you know, to, to get there. I, I'm not convinced that it's a bad game because I love this game. I think it's great. And I think we do see very deserved winners in the end of it. So I can't complain too much. But for the consistency of the events, I think it'd be really cool to see a, a double yeah. elimination. I think so too. Um, I think it'd be interesting to try at least. Sure, yeah. Uh, I'd like to talk about now, really briefly, a little PSA here. So, yes. so my top eight opponent naveled me, right? I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't a situation I could really play around. I had nothing. I had a terrible flop. He had a good just flop. Right. It just it just happens, right? You get beat sometimes, yep. uh, and it's fine. I was like, okay, I I think I can even play around this actually because I had I had some cards to be able to play around it. It was more what he did on the second turn that really buried me. Um, but the point is that after he navelled me, he was very happy, right? Which is he should be. He should be very excited. He's in a regional. He's just navelled me. He's just taken a huge lead. He's probably going to win. That's great. Um, And he had a buddy watching the game with him, which is also fine. Um, But the PSA is don't talk to your buddy during the match. Don't crow about your victory before it happens. Just concentrate on the match. And then after the match, you know, go crazy with your buddy. You should. You should go crazy. Um, But in this particular match, this, this very nice man, by the way, I do not have any malice towards him. He seemed like a very nice person. His buddy is like, you just enabled him! Oh, can you believe you caught him? Oh my god! And then like ten other times in the first two plots, he would call, he would like lean over and be like, "I can't believe you caught him with that navel, man. He's so dead. <laughs> oh my god!" And I was like, I was thinking like, "Yeah, no, I really am dead. Not so much from the navel, but just the the situation. You should be excited, um, but hold it in until after the match, uh, and then you know explode if you need to. That's fine, but but don't do it." During the match, it's sort of disrespectful to your opponent, um, and it's it's definitely annoying. So and I'll extend it too. Do not stand around and watch a game from the eye lines of the opponents. You know, stand in the corners a little bit. You don't want to talk. Like if you're talking about it, like things can be given away. This is a game of information. This yeah. is a game of anything, and you'd be crazy to think that people aren't reading faces and seeing things. If you're looking at your opponent's hand, and the guy across from you is looking at you. You know, he's looking at you for some kind of information. So yeah. You know, be be courteous, and you know if you have anything to say that's important about the game, don't even tell them. Tell a judge, and have the judge tell them yeah. if that's what the judge's prerogative is. It's not your place. The game is played between two people, and the judge is there to help make sure that everyone understands the rules and is playing by the rules. So, yeah, definitely don't, be courteous and, and you know celebrating. That's just bush league. Yeah. Don't talk to either of the participants during the match. Wait, wait till after the match. Just just don't do it. It's not a good idea. Hmm. All right. Moving on from that, I just want to point out, and, and just to be very, very clear, nothing wrong with this person. He seemed like a very nice guy. 
I look forward to seeing him again. Nothing personal towards him. He's just an example to use for, for anyone going forward. All right, Jason. So how did your day go? So I, I don't remember you in the cut. So I'm going to think that you didn't make the cut. So how close were you? You know, I did not make the cut. I went X2, so in this case, 4 and 2. Gotcha. Um, uh, I lost a close game and a close game. Fortunately, one of them was to Ryan Jones, which I wanted to play Ryan so bad. I didn't give him a good fight. I was really excited. I had a, I was playing Baratheon, and, you know, when you're playing Baratheon, you get Mel and Bob out by turn one. Pretty excited. And Don't I even milked his, And I even milked his Tywin. What? Didn't he just resign there? No. Oh, he both my guys and plays out a bunch of guys, and I can't find a Crescent. Furthermore, he has Ilan Payne, which literally neuters Crescent. Oof. So Oof. you can't uh, you can't ever get the Crescent out on the table. So yeah, without playing like a, a a card that will then kneel Crescent or kneel him, then play Crescent. Yep. So I tried to play around it, and unfortunately, it just became overwhelming. Lannister characters and Miri, and I just couldn't hold down, and he just crushed me. Well deserved win for sure, and uh, but I just can't, couldn't play out of the two milks turn one. Um, <laughs> if, I, if it was just one, you know, yeah. I had, we both confiscated the next turn. Unfortunately, that left the milk score at infinite to zero because he had one and I had none. So because of that, it just wasn't going to be good. If I could have had both gone, it would have. I would have had a real game, but uh, that just happened, and that's uh, that's how the cookie crumbles sometimes. So. You know, at X2, no one was getting into the cut, except one person did, that young lady who you played in the last round, right? Yep, yep. Kelsey. She, she had a killer day, and she made top eight, so I had my chance. My tape, my tiebreakers were pretty solid, but just not solid enough, and uh, so X2 on the day. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I, I do want to say something about Kelsey real quick. Um, I hadn't met her. She actually doesn't travel for events. This was, like, the first event she traveled to, and so she really... She really did well in a very important game. I was kind of hoping, like knowing her story a little bit, that when we were both in the 4 and one game, knowing whoever lost was out, I was hoping that my experience in cuts and making cuts would give me that slight advantage, right? Like there, maybe there would be a little nerves on her end of her first real big tournament like this, but there weren't. She played really, really well, um, and it, it was a hard-fought game. Yeah, and her and her friends did the proper thing and waited until the game was over. And then yep. when they announced that she made top eight, she was excited then. So that's also how you participate in in society, Tiny. <laughs> that's how we do it in the real world. No, it's not. If you're at a sporting event, you're, you're going crazy the whole time. You know, Spectator Thrones, it's a thing. It's coming. Yeah, I hope so. I can't wait. I think it's going to be on ESPN 4. Are they developing that now? The Ocho. The yes, Quattro. The Ocho, yeah. <laughs> All right, well, I want to. The main reason I have Jason on today is not because he's amazing, which he clearly is, um, but it's because I wanted to talk about his deck specifically. And before we do, I want to talk about where I see the meta at, and I want to see if Jason agrees. Mm -hmm. um, generally, to me, it seems like the meta is basically play a big, impactful, super powered character, it'll either have removal built into it or it will activate removal abilities like put to the sword or tears, get these removal abilities, get the big guys, kill your opponent's big guys with your big guys, and then win the game. That's a pretty good strategy. I think that most of the top houses right now or top decks are doing such. I will say that I think personally after viewing at least the United States regionals and many of the European ones that I do believe that the quote-unquote top three deck archetypes are all very different. And uh, I'll list that as Lannister anything, Martell, or Mar Martell Fealty or Martell Crossing or Martell sure. uh, Lion, and then a Stark Fealty. I think that the, at the end of the day, those seem to be the three decks. Now, Grant, does Lannister X populate a ton? Sure. But right. at the end of the day, it's like, is Miri your flavor? Is Dragon keeping your guys alive flavor? Is playing the camp and the power rush of big, you know, fast Eddie, your flavor. Yep. At the end of the day, that's you get your Lannister characters out and you supplement with some with some flavor. Yep. Or is crossing helping you push through and you get a lot more tricky events and such. Um, so I think that those three decks play very differently. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that Stark Fealty, what they do is they play a game that you have to like play around because you have to kind of stop them and they're not necessarily that hard to stop, but it means that you can't push forward with your plans. Because they stop all your plans, whether it's blocking with Catelyn, brand canceling events, 
Winterfell. Uh, Winterfell, you know, kneeling out and giving you literally nothing to do. I think that it's a very uh, it's a very powerful thing, and I think that's why I've seen some success against Lannister. And if you look at Martell, which in my opinion is what we call the player's choice. Yeah, is, oh, I love that deck. If you're the gamer and you're the, <laughs> the guy who wants to be the master of thrones, I think that this is where you're looking right now. Yeah. I think that it has a lot of power. It has the ability to scoop up characters really well and has the ability to really throw wrenches and plans and win really long, annoying games. Yeah, I, I think your your assessment seems accurate to me with the caveat that the Lannister big kill stuff represents a huge chunk of the meta and that while there's the Stark and the Martell deck out there that are good and represent different archetypes, they are, as of today, underrepresented. Yeah, I think that when you look at it, you have to say, specifically in a regional setting moving into nationals around the world, you have to say what's good in the Swiss and what's good in the cut. And it's yeah. something actually we talked about the other day. And it's, it, there is a difference. I do believe Lancer is better in the Swiss than it is in the cut. Not saying it can't win the cut because clearly it does. Mm -hmm. But when you get up there, the Martel player has that player's chance, that player's ability to play out of situations because it gets you out of tricky things. Especially with Lion alongside, you still have some decent powerful characters yeah. and some, some little tricks and tips that you get from them. And then uh, Stark is the same way. I think that they can really throw a wrench in the plan. If you only get plan one and two, let's just say we break your deck into three different plans. Mm -hmm. If Stark can handle plan one and two, it comes out of nowhere. It's really frustrating. Yeah. So I think that's, that's why... I, I, I think a Stark of those three decks is worse against the field, personally, mm -hmm. uh, playing in the Swiss. But once it, get up, it gets up there, I do think it can do some good. Um, and that's why I think we see whenever there's top eights with two Stark fealties... Sometimes, or often even, they you've seen them rise up. And especially on the East Coast, clearly they're favorable of it. Yeah. I think West Coast, we're really still just a really strong Lannister meta. And I think that we're, we're, we're citing in the tools and the banners and the crossing uh, to go to the strength of the, the player. With you know, and, and you look at the decks that you see. I mean, like someone like Ryan or someone like, uh, like many of the decks that were at Kubla. You get those tech choices in there, and it really can it really can tweak the the combat math or tweak how your deck is supposed to play. Uh, specifically, like Ryan running a bodyguard or two in every deck, it's just enough to keep the guy alive to be able to push through what he was looking to do. Rather than play big guy, you play big guy. Your big guy beats my big guy. Game over. Right. Kind of helps you set up and stay up. Yeah, like in my Lannister deck, I had a bodyguard, two milks, two seals. Right, like trying to do what you're saying, both keep my guys alive, neuter their guys if possible, trying to have as many options as possible. The one thing I would say with Lannister compared to like Martell, it feels like Lannister has the highest chance to 2.0 somebody than oh, like yeah. Martell. Martell is trying to set up a solid long-term game plan and there's a chance that they just insta lose to oh. Lannister and no exact draws. Martell's honestly if you were to rank them in new to mid-range player if you give them a Martell deck that might actually be the worst deck to give them. Oh yeah. yeah. I think that even a Night's Watch or Tyrell deck will do better in the hands of a mediocre player even than a fully kitted out Martell deck because I think you have to play it right. You can't just play your cards out and then expect it to win. You have to play around everything. You have to play in a fashion that makes it good and my buddy and I, uh, my buddy Dom and I like to make fun, but when we listen to other people talk about decks, specifically on your last one, you're like when um, your, your co-host Buzz at the time was saying, the deck has to be played perfect. It was so funny, we were just laughing at the way he was saying it, but in the end, he's not too far from wrong. That deck is not easy to play, yeah. which is why it isn't, a, isn't a Swiss breaker as far as seeing a lot of players just play it. I think that the players that know it can play it and the players that don't can't. Yeah, I, I played it... Um yesterday a couple games against somebody and i gotta say it felt like a different game like it was a fun game i was like this is game of thrones right <laughs> both games went eight plots i was winning the whole time but there wasn't just like a smash you in the face now you might as well concede it was like the slow grind like i make this play and then make this pro play and then oh you didn't see this coming did you boom and just all these little plays that add up rather than boom a tears to your face or a put to the sword to your face. That's the game. Thanks for playing. Um, so it was it was a lot of fun. And that has to be one of the reasons why it's bad for for most players because I, mean, I would say probably 90% of the time, and you Martell pros can debate or back me up or call me an idiot, but I feel like it's still going six to seven plots or five to, five to seven plots often, even in the best of the pilot's hands. Yeah. So it, 
you, uh, you extend the amount of time that you can fuck up effectively. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> um, and unless you're doing stuff like superior claim, which I've seen some people do, I don't like to do that. I, I don't feel like I want that artificial bump with a card that's not that good. Like, I just want to have good cards in my deck. Yeah, I mean, if you don't plan on running, like, turn three, don't play don't play Spirit of Claim. Now, yeah. it, does, it does have a place, in my opinion, when, you, when you're when you like, oh, if this goes right, I could just win turn three. Right. Which I think is a fine concept. But. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think some people, though, are running it as a... It can be damn hard to close with Martell, right? Like, sure. you got all these tricks, but you're not ever blowing people out. You're like, okay, I'm inching forward, I'm inching forward, I'm inching forward, I'm inching forward. Uh-oh. Oh, it's getting harder to inch forward. If I just had a superior claim to boom, close it out, that yeah. would be very helpful. And once again, though, to me, it, the one ofs in this game are very tricky to play because your likelihood of getting it is piss poor. Yeah, uh, yeah, for sure. So it's it's tough, but I think it's good, especially in a long tournament. It's not going to be seen by many people. It's not like your plot deck where by the end of the, by the, end of the tournament, pretty much everyone knows the, the winning player's plots because yeah. they've talked about them, they've seen them, even though, regardless if you're supposed to scout or not. You hear through the grapevine, you see it. That superior claim is effectively a plot, plot power level play that costs absolutely nothing that you yeah. can't, can't just let a player have. And so I think that that's probably why you see it, and it comes in very less, uh, much less frequently than, than not. So Yeah. So what I think is interesting about your deck, though, Jason, is it seems to be doing something slightly different than the three major archetypes, or as I call it, the single archetype and its two little brothers. Uh, mm -hmm. What is your deck trying to do? I'm going to send it to you because I don't think you have it. It's on the Skype there. I don't have it. I I was considering uh, trying to ask it from you for the regional, and then I realized, well, Jason's probably going to play, and he's not going to be like, yeah, <laughs> sure, man. Here, beat me with my deck. Or, it's, there. Or... it's there. You can blow it up on your Skype screen if you can. Uh, sure. So effectively, my deck, uh, 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 I think Kings and Queens, I like it a lot. I've played it in three regionals. I've... Lost four games in the Swiss over three regionals and uh, gotten a second and a third. And I'm pretty happy with how it went. Unfortunately, between those three, I couldn't find a win. But only three people win three of the regionals. So I can't be too mad with second and third and effectively a tie for what could have been a spot in the final uh, in the final top eight. It is a aggressive Baratheon deck that is using a Banner of the Rose to include a lot of combat tricks and keep people on their toes and win a lot of challenges that Baratheon normally can't win. So I guess I'll just kind of go through that. So once again, it's, it's House Baratheon, Banner of the Rose. I played, it was funny, one night we were testing, I was like, I should just be playing Banner, Banner Lion, right? Like there's no reason for me to play Banner Rose and I would play two games of Banner Lion, two games of Banner Rose, two games of Banner Lion, two games of Banner Rose. Yeah. And I was like, man, the rose every single time was the carry. And it wasn't, I thought, like I had turning grounds in my deck originally, and like I was like, oh, Tyrion's going to help me play these great events. And I never really needed it, because when played the way that I've been playing it, it which I would, would suppose is the, is the better way to play it, at least for me, I didn't need the money when I needed to. Or I, I didn't need to have that money. So the money wasn't important. Jamie is not as good as... Night of the Flowers, because Night of the Flowers can win power challenges and has renown all the time. And he allows me to bring in cards that are really sneaky, such as Marjorie um, and the uh, and the two knights, the Sir Halbert and Sir Horus, which just have a lot of synergies with the deck. I guess I kind of want to just note a couple notable Baratheon uh, Rose synergies before we start talking about it. One, Marjorie, Tyrell, and Bob. It's not a crazy synergy, but it's plus four strength. It allows you to get in that kneel, and they have to play around it. It, it leads to overcommitting, which is great. If you swing in a bob and they kneel four characters for it, I don't even care if you win because it's just that's winning. Mm -hmm. um, and so sure. Mar Marjorie lets me get over it or make them overcommit in the first place, which I really like. Um, you've got Hobber and Horus. Uh, Hobber is the man, though. He's the one that we really want. He is the one that goes and searches for a lady. In this deck, that is either Melisandre, generally, Marjorie or Celise, who's a real all-star. Um, Celise is a real all so she gets you your trigger. It's a lot more affordable to play eight gold worth of stuff than ten. But yeah. you you will notice, or which we can post this deck list so that people can see Yeah, it. that's what we're going to do. Just I am running it. a trading, um, and the trading, if you have Hobber in your hand, goes Hobber, yeah. Melisandre, yeah. out of your deck, one turn, no right. questions asked. So between summons and that, I have, I, I have a pretty effective way to find a map. 
um, and she really lets you be aggressive in this deck. Um, Nine of the Flowers, I really want to run three. I'm only running two. Every single game I get him out, I feel like he carries. The synergy with him is mainly with the Red Keep. Seven strength power challenges, you can only block with one person. Seven is a really, really, really important strength to have. Technically, it's six, but I'll even bump it to seven. Uh, you got the Hound, you got Fast Eddie, uh, you obviously a milked Tywin. Obviously, Tywin can't have more, but then if you're getting your Tywin melt out because of the single Night of the Flowers, that's a fair trade in combat math. Mm -hmm. um, seven strength, six to seven strength is just so high for power, and it's and he just dominates. Often, he dominates the game. Um, and you see things like Lady Sansa's Rosalind deck, two of, works. I win games with Davos, I win games with Sir Barristan Selmy, and Nye the Flowers, all getting massive uh, juts of power at the end of games. And just, I mean, I, I won probably, I want to say, out of all the Swiss games I played, which was a total of 16, I want to say I probably won four just out of nowhere, Lady Sansa's Rosing, like Selmy or, or Davos, to win. Question. So you're you're telling me, how amazing Knight of Flowers is. And I'm buying it hook, line, and sinker. Yeah. And you only have two of them? So here's the thing. So I the the additional Eye of the Flowers was going to go up to, uh, was going to be either a Moon Boy, um, I, which I have two of in the deck, because right now mm. this card this deck originally started as an experiment of how can I draw cards really efficiently. Uh -huh. And which, Red Keep and Moon Boy, I felt like it was really good. And I didn't want to run three Red Keeps like I originally was, which every deck runs three Red Keeps. But mm -hmm. I don't want to run three, and the reason why is because I wanted to make sure I was aggressive, so I had to play characters early. So I swapped him originally for a second Moon Boy or the second Crescent, which I thought was really important in this Milk Heavy meta. Mm -hmm. I only have a couple of one-ofs in this deck, specifically out of the Baratheon side, just being Shireen. And a lot of people would say, Jason, one Moon Boy is fine, or Jason, you know... Uh, Lesson is fine, but I just I upped those to deal with the meta, and I think all in all, over my games, I saw them being very valuable. Uh, drawing the Moon Boy for the flop rather than the Red Keep, very valuable to me. And I, I don't I, I love it because I feel like I have multiple packages in the deck that can help me win the game, especially because I often like to go first. And if they set me to second, I I'm pretty happy because I'm Baratheon. Right. And I think that the multiple packages in the deck, whether that being like Mel Neal out, which obviously can win you a game. But slash sell me going first that can be really great just overall renown rush with multiple renown characters it can uh i think that i can see a lot of different combinations of cards that win me the game and that's kind of last rest where you're like well i didn't get tie win this game which is a big burden but at the same time i got terry in the mountain and that can carry the game right i think that i feel often that i can get i don't have to get robert this last tournament, I got Robert, and it actually was a lot, and it was actually the worst I did in the tournaments, which is kind of weird. Hmm. And all the other tournaments, I like, never got Robert, and I won a ton of games. So it was very interesting in that respect. Um, I noticed you don't have any kill events, not a single one. Yep. Um, is that just they're just unnecessary for you? So nothing is worse than drawing a put to the sword on the turn that your parent, that your opponent plays a dupe. And I feel like sure. you said it yourself, this game is about playing big characters and getting them out there and winning the game. My goal was to win the game faster than they can play all the characters and kneel out them so that they can allow me to win, which is a very effective strategy. I was saying it in the, it was in the Sacramento region where three Lannister players, and in every single game they had the Mountain, Tyrion, Tywin, and Jamie out on the table. And I won oh, wow. four. And it's like, Man, that's like really crazy. Like, how did that happen? It's like mm -hmm. nothing's better than being a Lannister player when they pretty much have the whole family out plus Gregor. Yeah, and, uh, and, it, and it works. You know, it's it's really frustrating. I have three milks, tons of meal. Even hand justice would just ended up being better than put to the sword in this deck. That yeah, that card is so good. It is good. <laughs> that's ridiculous. You also see some cool plays when you, if you you know have sell me out and they do. You can do fun sell me plays where you kneel him. So like they stealth him with a military challenge to get through, and then you are able to kneel your sell me, which then prevents them from you know taking any military claim at all if it's just a normal military challenge. Wait, and back they, up. I, I missed you cut out for a second there. What? What are you doing? Okay, so let's say that they're just doing a normal military challenge and my board is getting thin, which often can happen. Sure. You can actually even handed justice to prevent another challenge, kneeling sell me, and then standing sell me after you claim one of their characters, one of your characters. So it's kind of like a null. They lose their characters, I and they lose two characters because they attacked with something with stealth, and they got a character knelt out. So when I have the crack back, I hit back really hard and take three to four power in one turn. Gotcha. And, and that, 
That seems to be what's so interesting about your deck is that if they try to target a kill, um, you can give up the one guy, I guess, to be able to, to swing back and get a whole bunch of power. But have you had this problem where they're able to just targeted kill knight of flowers or mel yeah oh i mean that definitely that definitely happens in in every match but my favorite matches are the ones where the the game goes really long and it's a really good game and you and i just feel like there's so many games where i cobble together wins with the weirdest little characters like i said the was getting a lady sansa's rose just mind-boggling just it's so much power in the end um you also notice i'm running a clash of kings uh instead of a second filthy that card is, in my opinion, right now, I think it's the best plot. I actually think it's my favorite plot in the game right now. You just, there's, you're not, you're never going to play Clash of Kings and not go first unless they have a bump. Because unless you run into a, what, a sneak attack, which that's just not going to happen likely. Right. Clash of Kings is going to let you go first. And it's a swing with a renowned character that wins a power challenge. is going to be, you know, three power. It could be more depending on the other cards you have. Or multiple renowned characters. It's just really easy to close out games with this deck. And I... For that, I really, really like it. Um, do you have? I don't see it. The attachment, the the mare. Uh, no, I'm not. I, I'm not running mare and heat. Uh, that was in the original version. Milks became just better. Milks really set them back. If you can just milk a character that does work or keeps them in the game, yeah. and yell out the other ones, it it's just too good. It's too good of an attachment, and it also brings my overall cost curve down by playing milks instead of it. Mm-hmm. Squeeze in the place where you normally couldn't. Um, I think for me the big problem is Mare uh, puts you in a lot of all or nothing situations where it's like if they treachery this, I'm dead. Yeah. And um, like in a non treachery meta, I love Mare. Uh, <laughs> That's but, not gonna happen. Right, exactly. <laughs> but like it almost cracks me up when people play Mare and they give me this look like, yeah, yeah, I got you now. And I'm like, really? I have three treacheries in my hand. That's. That mayor is doing nothing for three turns. Yeah, and, and, and Hand's Judgment was a card I was considering not playing um, because it is three spots, and that is a lot of real estate for just a card that might be dead. Yeah. Uh, for example, in my game that I lost in the Sacramento uh, top eight, like I ended up with two Hand Judgments in my hand, they sucked. Yeah. But there's so many more games where I'm able to just play really aggressive and get the power, and when they try to crack back with their events and things like that, it just doesn't go through. And I'd much rather have that. With a lot of military power icons, you really need protection against the tiers. And uh, I think that in the end, it's it's a it's a I think it's a worthwhile investment. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting that it allows you to be to both go first and be ultra aggressive and not have to worry about like, okay, I have the chud and that's fine, but losing by five is going to cause me to lose Mel or Bob and I'm going to be in trouble. So having the constant hands is good. I guess the question is, were you able to pretty much always have two back? Two... Two gold back to be able to, to pay for the hands judgment? Uh, for a put it sword? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, to be able to counter it. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, it, it all depends. The, the the deck has a lot of military, so it's actually pretty good at stopping put to the sword. Mm. You also have a lot of interesting variants in uh, strength between Mel and Arbor Knight. Arbor Knight, by the way, that card's nuts. The fact that you can pump Hobber and Horus which I don't know if you do know, but you can come Robert with that. That is so strong, and no one sees that coming. It's so money. Uh, I actually lost one of my games in Sacramento because he had to treachery one of my Arbor Knight pumps, because otherwise he was just completely screwed. So he had to waste a treachery on an Arbor Knight. Um, but it, in the end, it was obviously he ended up winning the game as one of my very few losses. But that is a really strong ability that really can tinker that math up to not being put to the sword. Sure. Uh, so it only takes like one or two. So I often find it's it's pretty pretty reliable at that. You've got a lot of ways to stop uh, to stop a lot of the put to the sword style decks. So I think it's okay. I think it's pretty resilient. Very I very rarely get. I mean if I if I get put to the sword, I feel like that game is already out of hand by me. Like I'm usually kneeling out and or controlling the the game with my military icons to that to that fact. So sure. I think that's interesting. So basically, you would say that your deck is also pretty reliant on big guys, but not with targeted kill, just more pushing fast enough so that they better draw their targeted kill immediately. And even if they do, you're fetching Mel, you've got a filthy, you're probably going to be able to control that board until you find your milks and you can put some more control on. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, we were talking about you play a big character, I play a big character. 
Yeah. The cool thing about Baratheon is when it's like, you play a big character, I play a big character, which also, I'm going to kneel your guy. Yeah. And so it's like, at that point, you've done a nut. You've, you're you effectively always a turn behind. And when if you can win by turn three or four, that's all you need, right? Yeah. If you play Tywin out of your hand, and I play Mel plus whatever I have in the flop, if I can win that turn, the next turn, sure, you'll have more gold, and sure, maybe it'll be good. But if I'm drawing into Milks, or I'm drawing into more Neil, or if that's my filthy double Neil turn, the advantages crawl up a lot faster than you'd like to give them credit for. And if Robert's on the table, as you know, playing a lot of Baratheon, it's, I mean, he just controls the table at that point. And then do you really want them to go second? Mm -hmm. That's that's a tough call. And you don't have um, any of the dominance package because, to be honest, you're thinking you're not going long enough for the dominance package to have a high impact, right? Right, yeah. And, and I just like to kneel all my guy. I like to swing every card every turn. So that's the same reason I'm not playing Stannis. Yeah, gotcha. So, okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I like that idea a lot. Um, I'm not a big Stannis fan. I feel like if you build your deck around Stannis, you've invested a lot in a character that's not that good other than his ability who is so vulnerable to tears to put to the swords because if you put that much into him and now the board's all knelt when they put out that big impact military guy unless you can immediately control him he does more because there are less available blockers and it's like it works i'm not saying it doesn't work i'm just saying for on a personal level i'm not a huge fan of the stannis style control decks yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not a control guy. I don't like to sit back and do anything. Uh, so, getting in there is the most important thing to me. And I thought that this was just a fun concept. And like I said, I kept building the other decks, fealty or building the the you know the. If I wanted to play Bear Main, Bear Lion, I was like, oh, there's got to be a better deck than this. But every time I came back to this, it just kept working. And clearly, I mean, my first two between my first two tournaments, I was. Uh, I want to say I was eleven and three against Lannister in That's just nice. in two tournaments, maybe or maybe uh, no, sorry, <laughs> no, my total was eleven. No, my total was eleven and three. Right. And my yeah, that's what it was. So the total is eleven and three against the three tournaments. So it's pretty. That's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, so I'm I'm not too mad about the results that I've had. And I've beaten some good players with it, and I've beaten some other not as good players. And you know, certainly I've gotten lucky sometimes, and certainly you know, but that's just 2.0, right? That's how it's yeah. going. Um, um, do you have it? You know, that question. Do you have it? And it's like, oh yeah, I have it. It's like, okay, well, good game. It's interesting because I played um, Bear Lion for a couple weeks and won a tournament with it, and it seems sounds like I was playing it very similarly to you, except for instead of stuff like Lady Sansa's Rose. And those renowned guys I had put to the swords. And yeah. that surprised the hell out of people. They're like, wait, a bear deck with put to the sword? And it was real easy to trigger, right? It's like, your military guy is knelt, mine is not, and now you're put to the sword. And it was, Robert it was deck. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, bear, I think, is phenomenal any way you build it. So, do you think <laughs> people a- were surprised to see Bear or Tyrell? Do you think you had a surprise factor advantage at all? Like people saying, <laughs> wait, wait, you can bump Horus? I didn't even know Horus was in the game. What is this character? I would say that often that was the case. That being said, I don't think there was an answer for it either. Sure. Like, it's not like, oh, I got to kill that Arbor Knight. Like, okay, that's fantastic. Right, like, yeah. if, that's your, if that's the solution to the problem, then yeah. it's probably a fine solution. I definitely had a lot of people be like, oh, Banner Rose, that's really cool that you're doing that. Yeah. Right. Like, oh, yeah. you're like, oh, you're... It's really cool that you took in this orphan dog. Like, yeah. you're a real nice guy. Exactly. It's like, oh, I just, and then you're like, oh, I just lost turn three. How many, I played so many games of worst, worst people where I ran it back. And I think in every game that I ran it back, except for one on the very last day, on this last tournament where I played two games, I think I ended up playing probably nine second games because I ended a lot of games pretty fast. I think I was eight and one in my second games, too. There you go. So I was able to, even after they knew anything that could happen. It's still a yeah. lot. It's still a lot. I mean, goddamn, Lady Sansa's Rose is nuts. It's hard to stop rush decks. Like, it's... the meta right now is not really geared to stop rush decks. It's geared to have targeted kill with Lannister and to stop Lannister decks, which are not rush decks. And so I feel like your deck is really well situated for this particular moment of just kind of being like, well, I'm going to squeeze through the crack there. I'm a different thing. No one's quite ready for me. And I'm just going to punch you in the mouth really quick. It's kind of like a Greyjoy deck, 
Only it does it a little different than Greyjoy, right? Surprise Greyjoy actual characters of substance. Exactly. Greyjoy needs to find other tools to make their few characters good, whereas you're just like, I got all these dudes and they're all renowned and yeah. awesome. And I and I dig it and I think that they're I think that they're good. I mean every character has a really good purpose in this deck. Things I'd like to do, I'd probably like to try out a couple of sixty one card variants. I I personally I I'm a person of math. It doesn't make sense. Why would you play sixty one mm, cards? I agree. If you play 61 cards, that means there's literally no card you could cut, and maybe that's the case. Um, I think that cards like Moonboy could be cut, or one one of the Moonboys. Mm. I think that one of the um, one of the Crescents could possibly be cut, and from there we could make some moves to do some other things. I like Rattleshirt's Raiders in the deck. That's the one card I've always wanted to put in. I think mm. be, if I were to put one on top, it'd be a 61. Sure. Uh, I would say that a majority of the games I lost were because of that extra milk. Except for the game against ha- Michael Hackman, which I love when you talked about playing before on one of your casts. Uh, he absolutely obliterated me. I kept a bad hand. He had a great hand. And that's 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 it. Yep, that's game. So, <laughs> There's no I had, coming I back that great that. flop, and the other cards were garbage. And I was like, should I risk this? And I was like, well, I'll flop a great flop, and then I'll come out. Yeah. And then I drew garbage, and then I just had a complete garbage hand. Yeah, so. that's... It's always tough, right? When you have the the plentiful flop without substance, which allows you to draw a ton of substance, and then when you don't draw it, you're just kind of like, well, yeah. I'm dead unless he doesn't do anything. Oh no, he did. And then he did everything. So did. that's just that's just gonna happen. And the plots, I'd like to have a. When I analyze plots, I like to look at them in a, uh, a <laughs> funny enough, a navelable fashion. So right now I'm running four navelable, three on. I'd mm-hmm. like to work that in. Particularly, I'd like to work in a winner plot. I'm still trying to figure out what that one is mm-hmm. and what, which one it would replace. Because Winter is really strong right now because of Winterfell. Winterfell is only going to get worse as they release more plots, but I still think it's a good idea to try to put a winner plot in your deck uh, upon further analysis. Sure. I think it's just a smart idea. Um, the plot that I've started, that I've just fallen in love with, is Close Call. Uh, five gold. That's a it summer is, plot, though, right? It's, I know. I'm just saying, just generally speaking, sure. five gold, immune to navel, as you were saying, draws a card. Yeah. My yep. God. I mean, like, I've been trying to squeeze that into everything. I actually took out March to the Wall in my Lannister deck to make room for close call. And you know what? I was happy with that choice. That's good. That's good. Yeah, I think, you know, March is like another plot that I really want to in this deck. Um, I was <laughs> Ryan Jones made a very proper gamble in our game playing only a Tywin on his flop because he mulliganed into it. Mm, interesting. He square. He, he sized me up and said, "You know what? I don't think you've got it." And he was right. Wow, that's that's a bold move. But sometimes you don't have a choice. Uh, yeah, he mulled into it. Yeah. And if I had that, that's a different game. I mean, my buddy Chris. Uh, nearly every tournament. If I'm not at it, I get a text that says it happened again, and that means he mulliganed uh, a single character flop into another single character flop, and every single time in a major tournament he's done that, he's been immediately marched and lost that game. (laughs) Chris has been rocking the Targaryen Lion pretty well. Yep. We played a game at Sacramento, too, and that was fun. It was good to finally get to play Chris. Did you end up beating Chris? I don't know. I didn't hear. I don't remember. Oh, you did. You did beat him. I do remember. I got a text afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> what did the text say? The text said something like, I just lost to Barra Tyrell. What do you think? Is that a real deck? Or did he just nut drop me or something like that? And I was <laughs> like, I don't know. It does <laughs> sound like he nut drew you, but the deck sounds awesome. Try to get the rest of the list if you can. In that game, I did have good cards and... He had, like, just enough good cards for me to play all my good cards on them. You know what oh, I mean? Oh, yeah, that's always fun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. It yeah, it's kind of sad when you get all your good cards and then you steamroll so fast. You're like, man, I didn't even get to play them all my cards. You didn't let me play Jamie or my yeah. Put to the Swords. You died too soon, man. Yeah, I believe that was a game where he had – it was it was one of those games which happens a lot, I found, where I think he had all of his – a lot of great characters on the field, and, and in the end, it didn't matter. Because I just had the right cards to get around them or, or do what I need. Yeah, so. I, I remember him telling me, like, yeah, he had Marjorie and Mel and Bob all by turn two or something. He just controlled the board every turn. And I was like, Chris, why aren't we playing that deck? That deck sounds amazing. <laughs> Marjorie is... Man, I love Marjorie. Man, do I love Marjorie. That's a card. Question for you. 
Go ahead. Do you fear Ward? Or, or are you You know what? You can't, you can't just play around it forever. You just do fear it, and you move on. Okay. If they get your guy, it's a four card. Why? It might as well just be the crown in, for all intents and purposes, except for it doesn't kill my Mel. So sure. I can't be too mad about it. Sure, they can have three of them, but mm -hmm. if you if they play the ward, and when I'm playing against Stark, I'm holding Crescent until really, really, really bad milk, or probably second milk, because I'll probably just confiscate the first milk. Once they play the ward, I can flop down Crescent, take it off, get my card back, go to sure. the from there. Jon Snow is a card that I think Stark players need to play more. It's going to give them a lot of ability to sacrifice people. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I I see like one in some decks, two in some decks. Yeah. I might be stupid enough to just run three because half the games where I beat the Stark player, they go, if I just had Jon Snow, <laughs> like I feel like I've had this conversation like six times. Yeah. If I just uh, no, like well, why don't you go get Jon Snow? All the good decks that I've been running into, and by good I mean placing high in events, like I've been keeping track yeah. to try to find some Stark decks and been using them. They all seem to have two John Snow. Yeah. So and I think and I think that's right. Yeah. Three sounds stupid, but three sounds like crazy. Said, if that conversation keeps happening, there's got to be a timing. Yeah. For yeah. You to just run three, but yeah. So it's <laughs> I'm excited about the Stark deck also. Like the decks that I've just. So here's my problem. Are you are you going to um, Gen Con or Origins or anything? Actually not, unfortunately. Okay. I'm in the same boat. So basically, until World, which is I believe four years from now. There is nothing for me to do with this game. So There's, uh, the fun summer tournament, which I, I, I'm excited. I, I hope we can get some hype about it because I think we need to get the community together. I really kind of want to see where they land that because if it's anything like the plugged in tour, they, they choose stores that's at. It's not just a public thing. They actually sure. go around and, like travel to them. Yeah. So I'll be interested to see that. I'd really like to get some good meetings there. But other than that, you're right. It's not. And that's not really important. No. It's new. It's not a competitive event. Like, I'll just bring a fun, cool deck to that. Uh, but the point is, because there's nothing to do from my perspective, I'm just not playing big guy kill card decks yeah. until for about two months and kind of see if I can find something that's competitive outside of that. If we get to Worlds and that's still the best deck, in my opinion, I'll bring it. Um, but, like, I'm going to play a lot of Martell, a lot of Stark. And so, uh, like, yesterday I played some Martell and just had so much fun. Fun. It was yeah. like, like my opponent had a duped Greywin and Catlin against my Tyrion post first snow, and it yeah. looks like he's going to destroy me. Um, yeah. And I marshal Gaston Gray, two gold back, pass. You got me. And he's looking at me and he's like, "So I just kill Tyrion? I mean, it's worth bouncing Greywin, sure." So he attacks with Greywin, bounce the Greywin, the dupe goes away because you can't save. Play Vengeance, Catelyn's dead, boom, board wipe. And he's just like, oh, God, that's so terrible. <laughs> and what is his option otherwise? Pass? Like, yeah. he doesn't have a great option. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited for the, for the future, too. I, I'm really hopeful. I think that this game is still really young. I'd like to harken back, once again, refer, refer, referencing Netrunner, because I was there from the beginning. I remember this very time in Netrunner. So first cycle's done boxes out how does the game feel and it feels very similar i think that netrunner blossomed pretty well i actually think that i don't think that i'm not saying thrones will be or is a better game than netrunner but i will say that it i think has the opportunity to have a more diverse crew i think that most of the factions are gonna have some pretty legitimate decks eventually and there's some cards we already know that are just really exciting for some pretty mediocre factions yeah that, that four cost dude that gains you power whenever you successfully defend a night's watch to me sounds insane there's just the wall. The wall is going to be broken someday. Like I that. know. It's gay. That guy says if you, if you successfully defend, you gain a power. Yeah. That's right. insane. I mean, really, I'm seriously starting to think, is there just a Martell deck, banner mm. to the wall, take all their icons away, play tons of board wipes, and then what are they going to do? Your, your icon moves keep coming back. They keep playing new guys and just strip their icons and go, come on, man. Come through. What's yeah. your problem here? It's a long game deck with a long game ending. That's the, how I like to play Game of Thrones. I'm tired of this like second grader game of like flip a coin and see who gets to put the sword first. I want to play some man's Game of Thrones here, Jason. That's fair. That's fair. I think it's good. I think it sounds good. Yeah, I'm really excited to see all these kings as well. I mean, they all will be very different, and I think that hopefully many of them are cool. Yeah, I agree. And the uh, the lion box coming out, 
I, I gotta guess it's not gonna be a disaster, and it's gonna be more like, here's a new Tyrion, here's a new Tywin, here's a new Cersei, new interesting, cool things. So it should be. Yeah, fun. I think I think it'll end up being great for Lannister. I just can't. I, I don't think that in a, in a good way. Like, yeah. he may play other decks that aren't just the smashy smash characters. They have to understand what that looks like, and I'm sure there's a couple cards here and there that are pretty good, but yeah, it's uh, yeah, it'll be interesting. I, I think my favorite thing is that the box will allow people to make poor deck building decisions. And I know that sounds really bad, but like... I get you, I get you. I consider Trial by Combat one of those cards right now because the full package isn't in there. Um, and a friend of mine was playing Trial by Combat. And I was just thinking to myself, like, awesome. You fell into the trap. You included bad cards in your Lannister deck. I'm so happy about that. And uh, there'll be more bad cards that look good to put in a Lannister deck. So that'll be exciting. Trial by Combat is an interesting card. I mean, it, it. I'm not going to call it bad like you did, but I'll call it... I'll call it suboptimal. It, to me, it's a card that's like, do I want to put my opponent in the complete smash turn one? Because right. other than that, it's really not that great. Maybe yeah. post-wildfire it's good, but it's... Yeah. I mean, it has moments, like post-first snow. Like, it's a total blowout card, but yeah. the problem is, do you really need that in Lannister? Like, that's all huh. Lannister cards. They're non-situational blowout cards, and you've eschewed non-situational blowout cards to put in situational blowout cards. And so to me... Yeah. It makes it a suboptimal choice. Well, I'll definitely play in the intrigue deck, and I think that oh, yeah. that and wardens like I make your hand nothing. Yeah. You're top decking. I kill your guys down. You have a couple. I get a claim here. Yep. I kill this guy. I do this. I do that. It seems pretty good. Yeah, it's going to be great in the intrigue deck. But and and following up on that, like the person I was playing last night, this is not going to denigrate him at all. I hope um, he said like this is more of an experimental deck, and it was just so fun to see bad deck building choices, right? Like, because there's nothing going on. So he was like, I'm doing an army's deck with the army plot and storm of swords and like no income and I can't play guys and I was just watching this and going, <laughs> this is what I want the game to be. Like, some people are, have the option to make bad decks, whereas now they don't. If you build a Lannister deck, you can't make a bad Lannister deck. You're like, here, I'm going to close my eyes. I'm going to randomly make a legal Lannister deck. Oh, it's awesome. Cool. That was great. And that's what sucks the most, too, because you're like, I want to be fluffy. It's like, oh, so you're going to put the best Lannister cards in the deck. <laughs> yeah. I like I like, I like, like the TV show. I want to put Tywin and Tyrion right. and Jamie yep. and the Hound and the Mountain in my deck. Congratulations. Yep. You just yep. built all competitive Lannister You decks. just built a Tier 1 deck, my friend, without even knowing what the cards say. Congratulations, <laughs> sir. They're all so stupid good. Yeah, yeah. So it'll, it should be fun going forward to have... Uh, more diversity, more cards. I mean, I think we should talk about Valor for a second. I can't wait for Valor. I think it's going to be great. It's going to be really fun to play around it. It's, I've never played in 1.0, so I don't know the exact situation. But to me, from what I can understand, is it just it, it creates a tempo for the game. You can't just play out. It's it, yeah. it just seems like a really good card, and I'm really excited to see it. What I found is that in 1.0, at least, the way Valor would play out is that it would create, like, slowdown points, right? Where you have a good board, and you could make the unbeatable board that could never be beaten, yeah. but it's super dangerous to do that because they could all die. So what it would be better to do would be to keep small advantages and grind out small advantages to a victory rather than just snowball to victory. Like, it, it sure. made you be more careful. It lengthened out the game a little bit more. Renown was a little bit less great because guys were dying more. Um, I don't know what Valor looks like. I'm just going to go with 2006 kill, okay. uh, kill all the guys. That That's how I'm assuming it's going to be. I'm actually going to start testing this. There's nothing going on, right, Jason? So come yeah. on over to my house. We'll do a Valor day. You make yeah. Valor decks. I'll make Valor decks, and we'll see how it goes. I'm in. And the thing to me that's interesting is that makes me a little sad. Is this Valor make dupes better? Which oh, is... way better. So it also makes Greyjoy are, right? are insane. Are there? Yeah, yeah, in some ways we are. It's going to up the luck factor, right? Like, exactly. not only That's did I up. put down Mountain, I got a dupe. Ha! You're dead now. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. And then uh, they're like, uh, also, uh, two Iron Mines and a Risen. So. Exactly. No, that, yeah. that, that's going to make Greyjoy way better. I, oh, yeah. Iron Mines, you have failed me. Why does it not say Greyjoy card? It would be a better card. It would yeah. make Greyjoy have an identity. Yep. But now you just put it in other decks. 
Yeah. Damn you, fancy flight games. It's a Lannister card, actually. It's, it actually, Jason, I don't think you've read it carefully. It says save a Lannister uh, character. I like uh, I like Greyjoy, not now. But I'm saying I like what Greyjoy could stand for, which would be, you know, the unopposed. Like, so I like the, I I hope that they're. And I assume they're doing the same thing. Where you're like, what are the key concepts for these factions? So we got the unopposed, the not dying, and the uh, and the pillaging. I think that's. I want to see the pillaging uh, come out a little more. Some really cool pillage punish, which would be neat. You know, I want to be. I want them to be grabbing guys from out from under the sea. And pull yep. them from their army or something like that, you know, press ganging them. I think that'd be a really cool concept to uh, to see, almost like a Gregor, right? Where a guy's like, pillage a character. If that character costs three or less, put him into play on your side of the board. That'd be yeah. cool. And then even discard him at the end of the phase. Sure. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Like, so it's so, not a permanent thing, but it is a good, nice, cool tempo swing. For you the could dirt. just sack him for claim if you went first, which you want to be yep. doing. To me, that just sounds like a really cool kind of thing. And, yeah. I think that that's uh, and I hope they get there with the pillaging. And I think that um, be- so. Shout out to FFG if you need some designers. Jason and I can work together. Yep. Yep. We'll split our salary. Um, yep. I'll well, I'll take most of it. I'll give Jason a little bit. Dude, I I I will work for free if I get to design the cards. I, just- I will not work for free. <laughs> Tiny would also do it for free as long as he can make YouTube videos about it. Uh, maybe maybe we'll see we'll see. <laughs> All right, Jason. Well, thanks for coming on. I'm, I'm really happy to see that your deck did as well as it did during the regional yeah. season. Um, it's cool to see a different archetype, especially with Tyrell in it. I know everyone thought it was cute, um, but I think you proved that it wasn't cute, that it was good. Uh, it's It really is a deck that I went to almost immediately. Remember, I was playing Baratheon exclusively, yeah. and when they spoiled Haber, I was like, oh my god, I can fetch Mel at will? Yeah. This is broken. And I briefly tried it, but you know what, Jason? I I still can't get behind Lady Sansa's Rose. Every time I look at it, I'm like, no, no, that card is not good. Jason is wrong. Everyone in the world is wrong. That card is not good. It clearly is. It's great. It's but great. my brain can't process that. It's great. So. Three power is just the same. You got ladies galore in the deck. I think it's fantastic. Yep. And I want to, you know, I, I want to say one thing, real quick. Not that the First of all, I want to say that in the Game of Thrones community, it's very funny how much people are, they love themselves and they love talking about other people who they think are great. So I think it's kind of funny that I'm going to end up saying this because I mock that a lot when people are on podcasts like, oh, you know, this guy, he's the greatest in this city. And it's, it's just such a stupid thing to talk about. But I will say I'm a new Thrones player, so I'm happy to be doing well. You know, I'm a translated card game player, but I really want to thank the SoCal guys for letting me and my, my good friend Dom, who playing a lot and we've been getting better and it's like it can be intimidating because we know some of these guys are so fantastic in the game and you know all of you guys are perennial you know top 16 world you know players and things like that but to be in such a competitive meta with such a gracious meta it's awesome socal's better than everything else sorry other places you kind of suck you know what i'm not sorry we are we are <laughs> i don't know how it happened like to me it's not a thing where i'm like yeah we're better like like a rivalry thing yeah. It just happened. It's really fortunate that we have, and I think it's because we have a lot of high character guys who are running it, mm-hmm. and that really shapes people, and, and people who are jerks are labeled that way and feel weird about it, and then like kind of come more towards the middle. Like We've had a couple guys that have come into the meta where everyone was sort of like, ugh, I wish that guy hadn't joined the meta. And then slowly they drift more towards... Reasonable. our mentality because it's just how everyone acts and it's when you're at a major tournament and you're like trying to be all you know like i'm gonna i'm gonna take advantage of you as much as i can and everyone else is being all nice and gracious you're like wow i look way worse than i do in a normal setting where everyone's kind of like that yeah i mean when you got people like john kraus and chris run things and make yeah. things great and ryan jones obviously too and you got ryan and john just holding the banner high for us and yeah. All these other players who are just great and have such excellent distinguishments and at the same time want to just make fun of each other and have beers and have a good time. It's a, it's just, it's a great place to play. So definitely, if you're thinking about coming out west next year for Kubla or for mm. any other events, yeah. I would do it because I think that this is a great place to play. Through. Yeah, and a quick shout out to James Speck who oh, yeah, definitely. I consider him to be the most underrated player in Game of Thrones because he hadn't won a regional or higher level event. 
He got the monkey off his back. He took down a giant 52-person regional. He's a very talented player. About damn time. Very nice guy as well, which is just nice. Yes, yes, very. He's one of those real high-character guys that has helped shape the meta in a very positive direction. Sweet. All right, well, we'll see you next time on Summer's Coming. Hopefully you'll be there.